Welcome to the Cornelia Stephanie Show, everyone. I'm so, so excited for this brand new series that we're rolling out, the series of the stories of hope. And this new series is uh, a series that you can catch on the first Friday of every month at 12 o'clock Pacific time. What's so great about this new series is that you're going to hear stories of hope. You're going to hear stories of people that have come um, insurmountable challenges and that have experienced deep trauma and that have experienced, you know, challenges, deep challenges, yet they have turned their challenges into wins, into victories. And I don't know about you, but now more than ever, we need those positive messages, those positive influences, those positive um, examples of what it is that we can do to raise our vibration, to be better stewards of our physical bodies, of, um, of the earth, and really to support each other to build a more sustainable lifestyle. And I don't know about you right now, but one of the ways that I like to always check in is I like to check in and find out how everybody's feeling. Because right now with all the world events that are playing out big time, huge pandemics that are taking place, the coronavirus, we've got that going on as a pandemic. We've got violence and um, racism as another pandemic, and that has been for a long time. So there's a lot of feelings that um that people are feeling right now. And really, you know, I know Black Lives Matter and everyone, all of us matter. We all matter. And I want to, you know, really ask you now to check in with yourself and see how are you feeling? How are you coping? How are you dealing with everything that's going on right now? And what is it? How are you managing? How are you managing? You know, because everybody is in a different place. And everybody has feelings and they all matter. We all matter. So that's that's what I want to do is really get you to, to look, check in with how you're feeling. And then maybe, you know, reach out to someone. And if you need somebody to talk to, if you need to go vent to someone, if you need to be held, if you need to, you know, have somebody listen to you, um, or if you're feeling strong and you're feeling like, I want to reach out to this person and check in with them and check and see how they're feeling. You know, because the one thing is that let's not not talk about it. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about how everybody's feeling. And once we can see it, once we can feel it, once we can acknowledge it, we can heal it. And that's that's what I see for all of us today is that I see that we can, we can overcome and heal what is happening for us on a global scale and let the healing begin. So I just wanted to speak to this. It's June 5th, Friday, June 5th. I'm so excited for our first guest. Let me tell you about who she is. This is Amy Walker. Amy Walker is her AKA is the dietista. And Amy is going to talk to us today about how to be the boss of your body. And she has been on um, several different podcasts in Seattle. She's calling from the UK, which I think it's absolutely amazing that she's, she's joining us today from um, the UK. Welcome to the show, Amy Walker. Thank you so much, Cornelia. It's so lovely to be here. Um, yeah, um, as, as Cornelia said, my name is Amy. I'm known as a dietista. I am a nutritionist with over 13 years experience helping people heal their guts. Well, people in a digestive crisis heal their guts and be the boss of their body. Um, so 
I take people through a bit of a journey and but before I kind of get onto that I just want to talk about my own and the reason kind of why and I think it's really applicable for the now the reason why I help people be the boss of their bodies is because if you can be the boss of your body like really be the boss of your body that can translate across to every single area of your life but first of all you really need to make sure that you are in the correct mindset and you are putting yourself first and what I mean by that is this I wasn't Mm. and my story (laughs) starts in a living room in somebody's house who I'd never met before on a group um, in a group event with a self-help professional there that day to teach us women self-love mm. and I decided to have my eureka moment where I cried in public which is something as a typical Brit I just do not do or did not do at the time and I decided to have that day in a room with a room full of complete strangers and it was the most terrifying yet fantastic day of my life we'd been on this journey and I perhaps wasn't making great choices for myself and this is why I'm telling this story because I had started I'm a nutritionist and I help people with um making good choices for their diet healing their guts if they've got IBS and ulcerative colitis I am brilliant at fixing that however there are things trans you know things happening in my life whether it be with you know the people I was dating or the food that I was eating I went through a phase of perhaps drinking too much and that was because as it transpired I did not have enough love for myself at all and even saying this on a show like this today is something if you'd have met me five years ago, it just would not have happened. Because I was the type of person that held it all together, everything was fine. If you did that, this, that, this would happen, completely disconnected from myself, from the planet, from the human beings around me and all the relationships that I had with my family, my friends. And um, I really couldn't, understand why it was that certain things in my life I class myself as a nice person <laughs> you know certain things in my life weren't quite happening the way I wanted them to and it all transpired that we were in a room um, and everybody was going around and you know really letting everything out beautifully and talking about the things that they were scared of and the things that they weren't happy with within themselves, within their lives, and they're being very, very raw and emotional. And I remember sitting there, not putting my hand up, hoping it would all happen and just go, and I'm thinking, I'm not speaking. I am not speaking. You, This is not happening for me. I'm not buying into this. Absolutely not. And you know what? I got away with it. I actually got away with it until he came around the room and he said, okay, everybody, one last exercise before I go. He said, put your hand on your heart, taking a deep breath. So I did. And then say to yourself, I love you. And I could not do it. And right at the end of the session, almost free, I just broke down into tears. And it was the most beautiful and terrifying and vulnerable position place I have ever been in from that point I decided that I was going to start making better choices for myself and look into what was going on with me a very long story short and with a lot of fabulous help I was able to identify that I needed to respect myself more love myself more and actually start putting me first saying no to everybody that I was helping, which was everyone, depleting myself completely, saying no to people that, you know, I just didn't have the capacity for, not the love or the want to help, but the capacity for, and actually start making the decisions in my life that benefited me. And the reason why I tell that story is because this is what I urge and work with alongside nutrition, my clients to start making for themselves. 
because without making putting yourself first and actually truly feeling how worthy you are you are never going to be able to push past or be consistent heal your health have good relationships um you know go on your entrepreneurial journey travel the world if that's what you want to do you have to find it within yourself amy incredible i love the whole dialogue and getting us to love ourselves more that that's the place it has to begin please tell the audience today where they can find out more about you how they can get in contact with you okay great so you can catch me on you can get me on the dietista.com you can get me on facebook the dietista instagram the dietista and if you need to transform your life and your digestion and your health that's how you get hold of me awesome thanks everybody we're going to take a quick break on the cornelia stephanie show we'll be right back we'll be right back Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. It's an awesome show that we have today. And I'm super excited to introduce you to our next guest. Our next guest is Tony Black. And Tony is a mind body life coach. She specializes in helping adults transform through play. I'm super excited to welcome you to the show, Tony Black. How are you? Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Super happy to be here. I am doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing really, I'm doing really great too. So you are uh, calling from, you live in Okinawa, Japan. I do. I live in Okinawa. Okinawa. Yes. Okinawa. Okinawa. Island. And, and this is just, I just love how, you know, how technology is able to bring us together even though you know we have the social distancing that we've been experiencing <clears throat> and at the same time there is a, also another level of connection taking place that that normally we might not have have taken advantage of and that is through you know doing these zoom recordings and um meeting each other online more and more and more and and so that's that's what you're here to do today to share with us what your story of hope is what your core message is and share with us uh our share with our beloved audience uh an inspiring tale of your core truth thank you thank you well i'm excited to share okay uh, yeah <laughs> so my my core message today has to do with finding truth, finding your truth in struggle. Um, in my life, and I know that in, in all of our lives, most of our lives, uh, we have lots of stories of transformation. Mine started with abuse, um, tragedy through the, my daughter's birth. She was born with eight feet of intestines outside of her body. I was homeless, institutionalization at one point. Uh, triumph of moving overseas. Uh, I went. I moved from New Mexico to Germany and now to to Japan. So it's been a you know that that's been a fabulous experience. Uh, and also coming to terms with with being gay. Um, so life's been very very interesting, full of transformational experiences and opportunities. Um, but life as I know it today really began when I met my wife and I invited her to live with me in Germany. And, uh, and her daughter, eventually she came to live with us as well. And it was um, a, a very challenging experience, mostly because my, my wife didn't have, at the time she wasn't my wife, we couldn't get married quite yet. Uh, she had, we had a lot of struggles trying to get her um, to be recognized as a citizen in the military community. And eventually things started to fall into place, thank goodness. And we were able to get married and it was just a great, wonderful, happy, happy day. And, uh, um, and so, yeah, that was, that was a, a 
a great triumph. And her daughter ended up, she was living with us before she ended up moving back to the States. And um, and everything was just, it was just so hunky dory and just so fantastic and rosy. And and I really just did feel on, on top of the world at the time. Until one night I woke up and it was about, I want to say about five o'clock in the four, four or five o'clock in the morning. And I woke up with this pounding headache and my wife's phone just kept ringing. And, um, and finally she picked up the phone and it was her older daughter and she was crying and, uh, she was asking us to come back because her sister had taken her life. And, um, and so quickly we made plans to go back to the States to attend the funeral of her daughter. And uh, when we went to the funeral, it was just, it was a surreal experience. It was just everything. I, I was a, a mover and a shaker and I was really into uh, working out. I'm a NIA practitioner and I was pra- doing teaching classes and I was very, very active. And, right there in that moment when I felt the the weight of this news, I just couldn't move. I could barely even breathe. And um, so when we get, went back to the States, I went to the funeral and the, and the way and just seeing her daughter was, at the time she was 13 years old, the one who passed away. And, um, and at the time, I remember seeing how many children were present for her funeral. And I even remember her best friend coming in <clears throat> to the, to the funeral home. It was an open casket, which I just will always, always just be very angry about. But uh, I remember her, her best friend came in to the front door from the front door of the, the funeral home. And just seeing the way that she fell apart at the sight of her best friend and uh, in, in that casket. And the day of the funeral, I remember walking through, it was almost a sea of children. There must have been something like 300 children there. I mean, when I say children, they were older, they were, they were teens. And the thing that I noticed most about them is that they're, there was so much heaviness within them that I could tell didn't necessarily come from the passing of their friend. It was the, the sense that their childhood had been taken away a long, a long time prior to this through, um, through, you know, play had been taken out, taken out of their lives, that, that joy had been taken out of their lives, the expectation that they must do these things and um, sort of conform uh, had taken a lot of the joy out of their lives and they were hurting. They were in such pain, all of them. And, um, and this is something that she, my, my stepdaughter had passed away with in her heart. And uh, she lost her life for that. So um, it took some time to move myself out of this, this place of pain. But one thing that I needed to do was I, at the time I had been working as an educational technologist. I wasn't in the classroom. I was just kind of helping kids with computer stuff in their classrooms and stuff. Uh, but I came back to work and I, I craved being back in the classroom. I really needed to connect with, with kids and to work with them. And the one thing that I pledged was I would bring play back into their classroom day. Um, and so I would take them outside. Uh, we played, I emphasized play a lot more than I did sitting down. I, do not believe that children should be sitting down in classrooms. Um, (laughs) They they really need play. And it was just so 
cathartic and so healing for me to be able to watch them play, to see them interacting with one another, to see them interacting with trees and nature and, you know, just their environment. Cause this is something that kids just don't do these days. It's not what they have. They have, you know, they're born with screens in their hands these days and they don't really understand what it's like to interact with their environment. Mm -hmm. And so this was giving them the opportunity to interact with their environment. They were learning a lot more about the way that their environment works and their, how relationships work. And they were able to understand a lot more about what they read. And so their academics actually ended up flourishing. So they were doing very, very well. Uh, and the best part was that they were able to keep that sense of joy and wonder and, and magic, you know, alive as long as I was with them there in the classroom, which was just, it was so healing to me because mm. I was able to reconnect with my own magic and my own, uh, my own joy. And this is something that I have continued to, to work on within myself, but it's also something that I believe all adults need. <laughs> you know, I think a, a lot of us had this, um, had our joy and our magic kind of almost beaten out of us throughout time. So, um, so, so yeah, what you're saying is it's time to get our joy back, to get our sexy back, to get our play back. Yes right? Is that what yes. you're saying? Yeah. Yes, yes. And to, you know, there was just so much truth in the struggle that I had experienced. I, I reconnected with the parts of the, with the parts that I just loved about my life way back, way back in the day, you know, with art and music and creativity and movement. So yes, I believe that adults need to, the, need to do the same thing. And, uh, and today I focus every day on connecting with sensations of, of joy to find that truth. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, if you're, if you're hearing this today, life struggles are just full of juicy bits of truth, even though, I mean, they, they might be the, the biggest painful struggles, but there is so much truth in each of, in, in those experiences. So what would you like to, thank you so much for sharing all that. I, mm. I have so many uh, uh, threads I could open up with you and ask you about so many things. Being gay, uh, I have overcome suicide myself. You know, I struggled with suicide, you know, most of my adult life. So I could open this up in many different areas uh, of, you know, discussion. What would you like to leave our audience with? First of all, let's tell everyone how they can get in contact with you and how they can learn more about what it is that you do and where to go. Yes, yes. You can find me on Facebook at Tony Black. It's just Tony Black. That's my best page. And um, you can email me at Tony at mindbodyplayground.com. And I also have a website. Right now it's Tony and Kim. It's going to be changing mindbodyplayground.com. I love it. And I love the work that you're doing, bringing the play back. We all, you know, we all are our, our children, our children's children, our inner children, our grandchildren. It's really time to bring um, the joy back and give that wholesome, uh, simple way of connecting with nature. Uh, oops. <laughs> Of connecting, exciting. <laughs> you know, of connecting with nature and, you know, so that we can go back into our organic play because that's, that's what it is, you know, to have, to have fun and to play and to enjoy. Absolutely. So what would you like to leave our audience with today? What's the, what's the message you would like to leave us with? Just that life is a pro if life is approached with joy uh beginner's mind and the wonder of rebirth that is revealed through through transformation um you can you can sense this through sensation you can do it through creation and through connectivity so yeah so so go out there go play go connect with that that you know that inner child that wonderful part of yourself Thanks, Tony Black. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for listening and tuning in. We're going to go to a break, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in to today's series of Stories of Hope with Cornelia, Stephanie, and friends. I'm going to get straight away into it, and I'm going to introduce you because we we're going to want to we're going to want to talk to this lady. Her name is Kathy Nubith. Is that Nesbitt. how Nebith? Nesbit. Nesbit. Welcome to the show, Kathy. It's Thank nice you. to have you on. Thank you. Yes. And so let's tell the audience a little bit about you. So you are here to talk to us about how to live a sustainable life. And you are a health and wellness advocate. You are the founder of Kathy's Crawley Com Compost, right? And you are the founder of the Sprouting Club and also the Laughter Club. And so I can't wait to hear a little bit about both of those. And you are an award-winning, multi-award-winning uh, multi uh, environmental innovator that, <laughs> and you put on workshops around, around uh, your communities about how to help people, how to help people live a sustainable life. And so welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you, Cornelia. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on your program. So, so today I would like to share a bit of my story about how I went from being a, an, uh, an employee to an entrepreneur. Um, you know, nobody in my family was uh, are self-employed. Everybody, you know, the message that I got when I was growing up was get a job, work hard, be loyal, be committed, and the company will reward you. Uh, with a gold watch <laughs> that you don't need when you retire. <laughs> um, so I also heard the message that I got, I'm 57. So when I was growing up, the message that I heard for girls is that they could get, there, there was a few jobs they could have, five in fact. <laughs> they could be nurses, teachers, waitresses, stewardesses, or secretaries. So I, I kind of thought it was a random list, but okay, of that small list, what can I do? So I decided I would be a secretary. I took all the courses to be a great secretary, dictaphone, um, shorthand, really beneficial today, <laughs> and how to make coffee. <laughs> I was a great secretary. I was a great secretary because I think you can learn anything um, you know, that you put your mind to, you learn the skills, you do the job. And I was a people pleaser. So I was very good at doing what I was told, being on time, you know, doing the job, doing it well, all of those things. It wasn't enough. I didn't know it. I, like, it wasn't enough, but I didn't know what my options were. I really didn't know that there was a choice. And I didn't even know, this is what is so funny. I mean, I was the president secretary of a, a full of a watch. And, you know, jobs came up in marketing or whatever. And people were like, oh, you'd be great in customer service or marketing. And I'd say, oh, I don't, I don't know anything about that department. As if being the president secretary didn't give me, I mean, I was the gatekeeper. I knew I, I had all customer service. I had that. I mean, I had to deal with all the angry customers. There wasn't any. <laughs> um, yeah. So I changed jobs regularly, by the way, I changed jobs often um, because I was looking for something. I didn't know what I was looking for. And then uh, I was getting my job, my getting my psychology degree. I went at night. I started in 85, graduated in 2000, got a job at a group home. So I was in my kind of field and I realized that they didn't compost at this organization. I was like, huh, they don't compost. So when I looked, when I talked to them about composting, they said they didn't need the fertilizer because they had cows. And it was the first time that I realized people don't connect what they're doing. They were producing all of this food waste and then paying a lot of money to get rid of it. So I proposed a, a way for them to, I created a composting program for them to do composting on site, save money. And the greenhouse manager said to me, hey, why don't we do worm composting? Now I missed a piece of my story, but when I moved out of, uh, I moved into my house, 
a teacher friend asked me to look after her worm bin for the summer. And as an avid gardener and composter, I knew the value of the compost, but I didn't like worms. <laughs> so I took on the challenge. I, I think also we should take on challenges. You know, people allow other people to decide for them way too often. I think, you know, when somebody says, um, hey, you want to try this? And somebody pipes up and says, you won't like that. Oh, good. Thanks for saving me the time. <laughs> right? We need to try things for ourselves. So I took on the challenge of these worms in my house. It was a nightmare. I mean, I had a fruit fly explosion. It was horrible, but I really wanted to keep the worms alive. That all happened because now I'm a worm farmer. But so at the end of the summer, you know, it was a big ordeal to get rid of, to separate the worms in the compost. Uh, what happened? Then I got injured at work. There was an ad in the paper and uh, it said, are you a woman? Do you have a business idea? And it was a six month course to take a business, to write a business plan. So I said to my husband, I'm quitting my job at the group home. I'm taking this course. I'm starting a worm business because I knew the value. I mean, I missed a piece in there. People will have to visit my, <laughs> visit my page for the rest of the story. <laughs> So I, so I took that course, that was 2002, and then um, I started my business. In 2002, there was a garbage strike. Now, my business is indoor composting with worms, worms in the house. Um, I'm, just, I'm just outside of Toronto, six million people, half of them living in condos or townhouses with outdoor, outdoor space for composting. In 2002, our landfill closed. And we started shipping garbage to the United States. Not just out of, out of Canada. We shipped our garbage to Michigan. Can you imagine? No, I can't. I've never heard of anything like that. Ridiculous. About 200 garbage trucks were making their way from the Toronto area to Michigan every day, Monday to Friday. 1,000 trucks per week. Wow. 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 I knew I had a solution. So I would, you know, I hear I had my business and I was watching the news and people were lining up for like three hours to drop off their garbage at the transfer station. And I thought those people don't compost because if you compost, it takes the stink out of garbage and then, you know, the strike can go on anyway. So I wrote, I decided I was going to go on a road trip and I wrote, uh, I sent press releases to all the Toronto media outlets. And five minutes after, a reporter called me and said, thank you for your press release. I wrote an article last week about composting. I forgot about the apartment dwellers. When you're done at the transfer station, come on down to the star. I'd like to interview you. I was like, yippee. Another whole big, long story. I mean, really about resilience and feeling, believing so much in what you're doing. I took on about 800 picketers or 80 picketers who were shouting at me. I was by myself. And I stood there, I stood my ground until they called the police. And I was like, okay, I don't want to cause trouble. I'm a good girl. <laughs> so I, I got my first article in the star, July 18th, 2002. I called up my husband. I was like, yay, I got an article in the star. And he said, I'm on my way home. I just got downsized. <gasps> oh my gosh. Now we have no income and we sell worms by the pound. Oh my gosh. What are we going to do? You know, so it's really uh, my message, I guess, today is staying, being true to yourself. If you're in a, in a job that you're like, I'm, I'm not really happy here. This is a perfect time to think about what do you want to do? Do you want to have your own business? I have to tell you, like being a secretary gave me so many skills, people skills, secretarial skills, admin skills, bookkeeping, all of the skills that you need to run a business. Yes. I'm so grateful that I had all that time. I don't think I needed to spend 20 years there, but I did. <laughs> and, you know, um, so I would, I really want to let people know that life, we have one life to live, live your life. And, and I feel like I'm living a, a magic carpet ride now that I found my way. I've lost weight. I sing and dance every day. You know, I do laughter yoga, so I'm laughing every day. And I actually teach laughter, which is so fun. I think as an entrepreneur, you're always finding, like, how else can I make money? You're always, you know, dependent on yourself for income. So always searching for, oh, what else can I do? What else brings me joy that I can bring joy to other people at the same time? You know, 
that is such a beautiful, exactly perfect opportunity for us right now for so many people out there that are facing, you know, the situation that you're talking about. I love your story. Please let's tell the audience how they can find out more about you. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, they can visit my website. I have a few, but I'll just give you one. It's Kathy's composters.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at Squirm, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm all over social media. And a little tip, I don't even have a cell phone. You don't even have a cell phone. So I you don't have, right? Yeah. yeah, I absolutely love your message and I love your perseverance and your tenacity to stay the course and be true to what it is that you, you know, that you were passionate about. And I love the part that you talked about early on and that is take on the challenge. Take on the challenge. And you did that. And look at you now. I mean, this is incredible. I definitely want to talk to you further, you know, on another show, have you come back again and talk to us about laughing yoga. We, oh, yes. we definitely, we definitely need more of that. Kathy, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening and for tuning in today, for coming in and sharing with our audience about how to um, you know, be an entrepreneur, how to go from a job to an entrepreneur. Beautiful story. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, everybody. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. How are you loving this series? I want you all to tell us in the Transformation Talk Radio Facebook page. Let us know how you're enjoying these stories. I can't wait to share with you now. This is another beautiful, beautiful story. The message that um, Dr. Venus is going to share with us. She is very well known all over the world. She's been on so many uh, news media um, shows. She's been on CBS, on Fox. She's been on many um, shows out there in the media and also reality TV. So welcome to the show, Dr. Venus. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate the time to talk to you today. It's wonderful that you're here because you have, you know, generally your message because you do everything with the body and fitness and health and wellness and, and all of that. And so today you want to talk to our audience about a very important topic, and that is how to stay, how to stay out of stress, right? Absolutely. I think right now it's so very important to remember that as stressful as life can be, as trying and as much tension as there can be in life these days, that we always have to do our best to take care of ourselves. Um, I, uh, as a board certified physiatrist, uh, that is what my specialty is in. I, had, uh, I have my medical degree from the University of Miami, but my specialty is physical medicine and rehabilitation. And through that, I do work in the hospital uh, in the rehabilitation unit, unit. I work with patients who have suffered strokes or have had a brain injury or even a spinal cord injury. I try to restore their function and optimize it so they can live as fulfilling a life as possible, as optimized as much as they can be. Um, but I found that I, what my real true calling is, is to be able to keep people from seeing me in that rehab unit. I would love to be able to prevent all of the, the chronic medical diseases that actually lead to things like stroke and heart attack and, and things of that sort. So I put a lot of my focus into preventing that through making lifestyle changes, what you're eating, what you're, what you're doing in terms of physical activity, and absolutely what you're doing to uh, manage the stress in your life. It is so stressful these days. I, I, I can't even, I can't even describe, <laughs> but I don't have to because all of us are living through it. Um, and the reason why this has become particularly important to me is mostly because of um, a couple of years ago, actually um, four years ago now, um, my father suffered a stroke mm -hmm. and that absolutely crushed me. Here I am, I'm a physician who cares for people with stroke. I, I help support the families learn how to manage these very, their loved ones and, and the new stroke that they are now having to, to deal with. 
that is what I do for a living. I deal with it day in and day out. And here it happens to me and it absolutely crushed me. I was devastated. I've been a fitness competitor. I was a fitness competitor for 20 years. So dieting, very strict dieting, very strict exercise regimen was part of my life. And it was, it was easy. <laughs> I learned to make it easy because I just made it a very scheduled part of my life. Um, so it came naturally to me after 20 years, it came naturally to me. And these things that were natural, all of a sudden I just shoved aside. I didn't care about what I was eating. I didn't care about getting out there to try to do any kind of exercise. I just wanted to help care for my father and give him everything that he needed so that he could feel that he was still important, that he was serving a purpose in, in my life, that, that there was a purpose for him. But in so doing, I absolutely, I fell into this hole. I, basically, it was a hole of apathy. I didn't care about my own well-being. Mm. It came to a point where I was sitting on a couch while my father was resting. I had given him a little buzzer so he could call me if he needed anything. And I heard that buzzer go off while I was watching some television, totally zonked out. <laughs> and as soon as I heard that buzzer, such frustration and anger built up in, in me. I was, I, was, I was exhausted and here I was, I had to get up and, and take care of whatever he needed. And then right before I stepped into his bedroom, I realized I can't walk in here looking and feeling like this. I don't want him to see that frustration and anger in my face. And that's when I realized I had to do something. I had allowed myself to fall into this pit of apathy where it was affecting how I was going to be able to, to care for people I love for. And, and that's when it kind of all turned around. I realized as busy, as overwhelmed with my medical practice, with caregiving for my father, um, and just trying to manage life in general, as overwhelmed as I, that was, I, I had to find a way out. And I realized that the, the best way was just take one step at a time, take one rung at a time. If I'm climbing up a ladder, just one little step at a time. So the next day, I just decided to sit on this little recumbent bike, the type of bike that you have when you're sitting down, um, and pedal away for about 15 minutes before I headed off to work that day. That's all it was, 15 minutes. I didn't worry about the diet. I didn't worry about uh, uh, how long I was going to be on there. I just had some time to do 15 minutes, and then I said, okay, time to go to work. And that was it. I did that for, for a week. And all of a sudden, I just started to feel better about that one little thing. Here I am, the type who was able to train in the gym for an hour every day, eat uh, six ounces of chicken and, and a, a half a cup of brown rice. I was able to do all of that before, but just that 15 minutes on the bike was all I needed to start making steps toward feeling better and doing things better for myself so that I could do things better for others as well. That's so powerful. I'm so inspired by that. And I know our audience is too. 15 minutes. Brilliant. It's brilliant. It's brilliant that 15 minutes is all it took to jumpstart, you know, a new, a new way out of the place where you were feeling. Yeah, so absolutely. Just that, one little step because that gives you the energy to then maybe, oh, okay, today I think I'm just going to say no to all that snacking in between. Let me just do that. And then that's the next little habit. That's just going to make you feel even a little bit more better. <laughs> yeah. And so that's the one thing. So what is it that our audience can do now, right? For 15 minutes that they can jumpstart. What would you like to, let's, let's tell the audience where they can look you up and find you because I'm sure that uh, you share on your social media. How can people get in contact with you? Oh, absolutely. You can jump over on Instagram. You can find me easy, Doc Venus, D-O-C-V-E-N-U-S. Or if you're, if you're more of a Facebook person, Dr. Venus, and you'll just spell out doctor, D-O-C-T-O-R-V-E-N-U-S. Yes, beautiful. Thank you so much. What do you want to leave the audience with today? Just, we have like two minutes to wrap it up. What do you want to give them a call to action to do? Well, today, I just want you to think I'm not even going to ask for 15 minutes from you. All I want you to do is take three minutes. 
do a four, seven, eight breath. Inhale for a count of four, hold your breath for a count of seven, and then exhale for a count of eight. Do that four times and you will immediately start to feel better. You'll feel more calm in these stressful times and you'll lower your cortisol levels, which can do a lot to increase all of your risks for so many different chronic diseases. Oh my God, Dr. Venus, I love that. I'm gonna, we're definitely going to be putting this down underneath the links to do this particular breath because uh, cortisol is a big stressor, right? Absolutely. Four, seven, eight. Easy to remember. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is awesome. Very inspiring. Thank you for the work that you're doing out there in the world and for being who you are. And, you know, maybe you'll come back again and we'll talk about another topic at some time in the future. Would Thank love you to. so much. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. We're about to head on over to the Energy Entrepreneur with Diane Solano. And thank you so much for this series of hope, these beautiful, inspirational stories of victory and triumph about how to come together and make a better world. Thank you so much. We'll see you all next time.